We are live. Let me remove my timer. You can go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Um, if we don't have any questions now, I am going to pull from questions from the uh, last live that we had um, that were left unanswered. So let me get the music. So we can start, let's see. There we go. All righty, so we are live. Let's go into the comments here. Hello, Muhammad. Welcome. All right, so uh, Muhammad says, I have hypomania and none of the mood stabilizers work. Neither antipsychotics. Can we add antidepressants with antipsychotics and mood stabilizers? Um, yes, you can with caution. Um, more so with someone who has full-blown mania, um, there's more of a caution there than someone with hypomania when it comes to adding in an antidepressant. The caution is, is that... Um, antidepressants can actually um, switch someone who's um, bipolar to either hypomania or mania. So if you are going to add in an antidepressant, um, always start low. Of course, you're going to be doing this under the direction of your uh, provider and um, always starting with the minimum dose um, you know, first and make sure you're giving it enough time before you increase it. So at least waiting, you know, that four to six weeks um, to see some results before jumping to um, a higher dose. That's, that would be what, you know, I would recommend. Now, um, oftentimes when I do see someone who's having some treatment resistant when it comes to their medications, I also explore root causes and um, those types of factors such as nutrition, uh, deficiencies, um, dietary habits, lifestyle habits, um, sleep, um, exercise, and things of that nature. So make sure that you are practicing those things, that you're looking for root causes, that you're looking for any deficiencies, any medical conditions that could also lead to depression, such as hypothyroidism, for example as well and uh, correct those because you'll get a lot of benefit just from doing those things as well. And hopefully you're already in therapy and working with a therapist to help to build skills to overcome some of these uh, lifestyle stressors or you know factors that could be contributing to your depression or anxiety. Okay. Um, and what practice you follow to treat this type of cause where none of mood stabilizers or antipsychotics worked? Yeah. So, um, like I said, I, I would, when someone comes to me and, and they're, they've tried a lot of medications um, that haven't been effective for them. That's what I do. That's one of my specialties is going into root causes, getting extensive lab work. I do have the video on basic labs for mental health. So you can see like basically what you can get, but I tend to do a lot more than, than what's in that video, but that's like just a start. And, and that can help to uncover if there's anything else going on that could be interfering with either the way the medications are working or can work for you, or even contributing to your symptoms. And of course, always looking at lifestyle factors, looking at stressors, looking at is there trauma, you know, where therapy would be very beneficial for those types of things. And if there's trauma, making sure you're doing some nervous system regulation and really helping to improve parasympathetic uh, tone, which is your vagus nerve. So doing a lot of work there can also be very beneficial. So that's pretty much how I would, um, you know, tackle that type of situation uh, with my patient is definitely looking for the root causes and then supporting them. And yes, if I need to, I, I will add an antidepressant with caution, like I said earlier, lowest dose first. And of course, with full informed consent with these medications, because long-term use can lead for some people to have problems. And then also, um, if you ever try to taper off, uh, it could be problematic. 
So making sure that you understand that. All right, let me get this ticker off here. I just realized that thing was still going on. <laughs> All right, land of the free. Yes. USA. All right. Your thoughts on gene site testing for medication. I'm going to do it. Yeah, that's awesome. And have you heard of the company? Yes, I have heard of gene site. I use both gene site and genome mind. I like both companies. So gene site is one that does the, they, they both do the same testing. So like as far as for medication, so gene site and genome mind, both are testing for looking to see if you have any metabolism, potential metabolism problems via your genetics. So a common one is the CYP2D6 poor metabolizer. So that, if you have that gene, not that it's common amongst people, but just that people who do have problems with medications or side effects particularly will tend to have this CYP2D6 poor metabolizer. Now, if you watch my videos, I talk a lot about drug interactions and different pathways that medications are metabolized by. And the reason why I do that is not only to highlight the potential drug interactions, but also for someone who is a poor metabolizer of that substrate like CYP2D6, your options are going to be very limited. So what the gene site test does and even genome mind is that they look for these different areas of poor metabolism that are um, potentially being expressed in your genes, right? Looking at your genes, seeing if you have that. And then they give you a list of the medications in each category. So for instance, antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, anxiolytics, et cetera, that would be appropriate for you as far as with your genes. Not saying that those medications that are green because um, both of them use like the red, green, yellow um, coloring, but not that the medications in green are going to work for you and be miraculous for you, but just that you're not going to have the issue with side effects and poor metabolism. Same thing if you're a rapid metabolizer of one of those uh, substrates, the medications may not work at all, right? If you're rapidly metabolizing it, you, you may need to be taking it more than once a day, or it just may not be effective at all. So definitely that's another consideration. It's not just looking at poor metabolizers. It's looking at all, you know, poor metabolizers, intermediate metabolizers, rapid metabolizers, and even ultra rapid metabolizers. So uh, it looks at that broad spectrum. Now, when I'm comparing these two tests, Genome Mind tends to be the one I lean towards more. The reason being is because you get a, a bit more from that report. It, it's a more detailed report. And for someone like me who does a lot of integrative mental health practices, I'm getting to see not only their MTHFR, because you can include MTHFR in the gene site testing. So if you've already ordered that, make sure that they've included the MTHFR in, in your um, report. But GenomeMind does MTHFR. They do two. They do the CT and the AC, which I talk about in my video for um, genetics for mental health and, and how the MTHFR gene is, is used in mental health. So I can have Raul, if you can find that and put that in the chat for uh, the, the audience, that'll be great. But that video really explains this MTHFR, the CT and the AC, right? Now, with that, it's giving you the whole picture with genome mind, but it's also, they also do other genes and they look at the comp gene. They look at Valmet. They look at, so they're looking at the way you're processing different things. They're also looking at if you are going to be more susceptible to, for instance, the antidepressants and serotonin side effects and genes that look at if you're going to be more susceptible to even weight gain when it comes to medications. So you're getting a whole lot more with Genome Mind than Gene Sight. The difference is going to be with the insurance. So if you have Medicare um, or Medicaid, I believe covers both. You have to double check me on that. If you're in, in the other realm of private insurance and you're ordering either test, 
The max you're going to pay with GeneSight is going to be 330 and I believe the max with GenoMind is 390 And I'll tell you that $60 difference is worth it, in my opinion. And I do tend to lean more towards the GenoMind just because of those differences are very important. They can tell you if you would benefit from exercise to help improve your mental health and your brain health. And just like I said, they look at the two variants of the MTHFR. They're looking at a lot of the different pathways, not just the medication side of things um, and side effects as well and different things that you could uh, potentially benefit from. So, so yeah, the, but yeah, I, I agree that if, if that's a test you got, it, it's going to still give you a whole lot of information that will help you and your provider with a treatment plan moving forward. All right. Ganesh T. Between methylphenidate and atomoxetine, I chose atomoxetine because it doesn't develop tolerance. So I don't need to give holiday. Am I wrong? I asked doctor for atomoxetine. So atomoxetine is a norepinephrine um, based reuptake inhibitor and it can, so the tolerance aspect of it, when it comes to nor um, atomoxetine versus methylphenidate, it's going to take a lot longer to develop a tolerance to atomoxetine versus methylphenidate. And the other potential with both of these, when we're looking at the stimulants, when it comes for, you know, ADHD is particularly uh, abuse potential. So obviously atomoxetine you know, very minimal, minimal abuse potential, methylphenidate, high abuse potential. And when it comes to holidays with methylphenidate, uh, typically prescribers will say, even, you know, when I have patients on, you know, Ritalin or Concerta or something, I say, take, take a break over the weekends, you know, when, when you're not in school and when you're not, you know, needing the stimulant effect because you can develop tolerance very rapidly with them. And also just to help avoid that dependence that can occur as well. Atomoxetine, um, you can do that too if you want to. You can take, you know, a holiday um, on it. Most people with uh, who take atomoxetine, they will take it daily because um, there is some cumulative effect with atomoxetine. So it, it tends to develop uh, as you take it each day. You get more and more benefit from it as well. So that's why people would would do the atomoxetine on a daily basis versus using it, you know, for, for the week and then taking their holiday on the weekend. Though I do have patients that will still do that with atomoxetine. So it's a, it's a personal preference there when it comes to the tolerance, though, it's going to take a lot longer to de develop that tolerance with atomoxetine versus methylphenidate. Thanks for your question, Ganesh. Uh, okay. Another one. Methylphenidate and atomoxetine at 100 milligrams equally effective. So the meaning both, uh, well, it depends on the dose of which methylphenidate you're talking about, Ritalin, because that's a high dose for uh, for Ritalin. Um, atomoxetine, th that's a high dose for both. Atomoxetine, usually we start with like depending 40, maybe go to 80. Depends if you're adult or child. So, and um, so there's different variations when it comes to dosing. So when it comes to dosing with stimulants or pretty much any medication, I like to start with the lowest dose first or the lowest, you know, therapeutic dose first, and then titrate from there to avoid problems like side effects and things of that nature. Cause it's, you don't need to go to a high dose right off the bat for some, for a lot of people to get effectiveness. And if you do go to a high high dose from the very beginning of starting medication, you're going to be more prone to the side effects that are mentioned for those medications. So I always start at low dose and, and no, you can't do dose by dose as far as methylphenidate and atomoxetine because they're, com they work completely differently. And so there, there is no dose equivalency with those two. Hi, Muhammad. Um, and what are your thoughts on type three bipolar type three? with adding antidepressants because type three is somewhat depression if I'm not, okay. I don't know type three. So with, with bipolar, I know of type one and type two, which uh, type one is mania. Type two is hypomania, which is what I believe you mentioned earlier, having some hypomanic symptoms, which 
can then be either in a current episode of depression or current episode of mania or current episode of hypomania. If you're bipolar two, then you can, you don't go into mania. You just go into hypomania. There is like a cyclothymic disorder uh, where you're going through different cycles and, and oftentimes depression tends to dominate there. So I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. There's also like rapid cycling with bipolar and mixed bipolar states, but I haven't heard it coined bipolar type three. So maybe it is. Um, and it's, and it's just new to me because since I changed my practice to just focus on depression and anxiety, I don't see a whole lot of bipolar patients, uh, as I used to when I was working in community health. So this may be something new to me. So I'm not discounting or, or saying that if it's cyclothymia you're referring to, then, then the, the cycles tend to be more in the depression stage and hypomania stage. So yes. And yes, you can still, um, use antidepressants. And like I said, with, with bipolar two, yes, bipolar one is where I would say, no, try to stay away from that and be very cautious with a bipolar one patient. You can use antidepressants with the hypomanic bipolar two patient or even cyclothymia again, still with caution, but not as much caution as with bipolar one. Okay, Elias. Hello, Elias. What are your thoughts on nicotine gum? Is it safe? Well, nicotine gum is definitely safer than smoking, either vaping or smoking cigarettes. So is it completely safe? No, I wouldn't say it's like 100% safe that you just chew on nicotine gum all the time, but it's used as a replacement for someone who is smoking or doing other methods of tobacco or nicotine, such as maybe chewing tobacco, which can lead to oral cancer and things of that nature, that is safer as a safer option, but also can be used for someone to help get them off of their vaping or their you know cigarettes. So I wouldn't say it's 100% safe, it's definitely safer then the alternatives like the tobacco, you know, chewing tobacco, smoking cigarettes or vaping, absolutely. And it's definitely can be used as a stepping stone as you're trying to quit doing those alternative things. So it's not something, you know, I would say just to do every day, just to do it. But if, if you're doing it in lieu of the other things and absolutely I would always recommend that for my patients instead of smoking, vaping, or chewing uh, to, to nicotine gum is very helpful in those regards. And you can check your state to see if they have a free quit tobacco program, if that's something you're looking for. I know in Florida, we have a tobacco quit program where they give the nicotine gum and patches and things for free for patients who are trying to quit tobacco. So they may have a similar program in your state as well. Thanks for the question. Laura. Hello, Laura. What are your thoughts on the difference between Vralar and Caplita? You know, Caplita is a newer antipsychotic that I don't have much experience with because when I left community health and moved into private practice, the patient population I see is primarily depression and anxiety, patients coming off of medications primarily, so in a deep prescribing type practice. So I'm not typically putting patients on antipsychotics anymore like I used to. So I don't really have experience with Caplita. With Vralar, when I was in community health, I did use Vralar quite a bit. It, it, it was newer on the market. It, it recently also got the uh, adjunct for major depressive disorder after I had left. So I haven't used it for that, but I did use it for bipolar uh, types, type one. And the thing that I saw with Raylar was that it was very effective. Some patients though would get that akathisia 
and we had to be very strategic with the dosing and how we were giving it, meaning 1.5 might not have been enough. And when you went up to three, that's when you had the akathisia. So we would do creative things like three milligrams every other day or, or you know, something like that. So because it also, Raylar has a very long half-life. So those are some things to consider. I cannot really compare the two though, because I haven't used it. I do have, when I say use it enough, because I just have one patient who came to me on Caplita, but uh, she is actually working on eventually coming off of it. And, um, and, and so that's the only experience I would say that, that I have, but, and she said it was the only thing that helped her. And she tried a numerous, numerous amount um, of mood stabilizers and antipsychotics and Caplita was, was the one that really helped her. Uh, but, you know, because of where she's at in her life, she's, she's wanting to, uh, you know, try to come off of it and uh, eventually, you know, have, uh, have a child. So, so I'm working with her with that, but, but like, I don't really have enough experience to compare the two. I'm sorry, Laura. Hello, John. Um, John Parrish. Uh, since COVID, I've become ag agoraphobic and afraid to drive. My doctor has given me 50 milligrams of sertraline, which I've been on for four weeks. I asked for lorazepam or equivalent, but doctor's reluctant to UK. To UK. Any advice, please? Oh, maybe the doctors are reluctant in UK, which is a good thing. Um, okay. So lorazepam is a benzodiazepine and I have videos on benzodiazepine specifically. And then even in my deep prescribing videos about the, the reason why providers are now being more reluctant with a medication like lorazepam is because there is a very high risk for patients to end up with something called BIND, a benzo-induced neurological dysfunction that can happen while you're on the medication. And then when you're trying to come off the medication and even when you're off the medication, one, one in five, so about 20% of patients uh, who use benzodiazepines for more than four weeks can develop something like this. So that is a, that is a, a pretty large statistic, right? So we have to be careful there. Then there's also the dependence and the tolerance that can develop with the benzos. Do I think sertraline is the answer? No, maybe not, but there are other medications you can try. What I would say is therapy would would probably be very helpful for you to figure out because with COVID, a lot of people ended up with this type of agoraphobia, afraid to, you know, because we were isolated, right? We were told not to leave our homes and that created a fear for many people. And so this is something that is actually an external stressor that developed or caused this type of anxiety and agoraphobia. Now, where benzodiazepines can be helpful is while you're doing the work and therapy, emphasizing using it short term, meaning two weeks or less, you know, or, or less than four, if we're looking at all of the research, it, it's not common for someone to use it for two weeks and then develop dependence, but it can happen and it has. But what I would emphasize with that is not every day. So in that time that you're working on your skills and seeing your therapist at least weekly, if not twice weekly, to develop skills to help with this agoraphobia and this fear of driving, that you can have something like that on hand to use to get to the therapist's office or you know to go to a doctor's appointment or to go to the grocery store, something like that, a couple times a week. But just in that short time frame while you're developing those skills before even going on either medication, sertraline or even lorazepam, because that is actually first-line treatment for agoraphobia. It's first-line treatment for, for this type of anxiety is therapy, because you have to deal with the the problem at hand, which a lot of it is the cognitive 
distortions that are going on. So cognitive behavior therapy and exposure type therapy is going to be key here. Otherwise, you're just going to continue to have agoraphobia and masking it with taking a pill, either what whichever pill it is, whether it's sertraline or lorazepam. But definitely, I agree with the reluctance to use the lorazepam. And that's why, and I have many videos that discuss that. I have a one coming out about the warning to providers specifically about the risks of using these types of medications. So, all right. Next question, Ganesh, ma'am, I've been taking atomoxetine from last four days. It raised my blood pressure. That is a side effect, a potential side effect. I've been taking it for four days. Definitely keep an eye on that and let your provider know. You may need to lower the dose or you may need, it, it may stabilize. Your, your body may adjust and adapt to that where it, it starts to come back down. Definitely let your provider know about the increase in blood pressure because that is a side effect. Muhammad again. Okay, hello. How we diagnose while it's type 3 or treatment-resistant depression? Treatment-resistant depression and type 3 have same symptoms somehow. Practice of diagnosis. Um, like I said about this type 3, I'm not sure what you're referring to, as I mentioned earlier, because I, I don't know what type three bipolar is. I know type one and type two and then the cyclothymia. So when it comes to treatment resistant depression, and I'm not a fan of that term either. If you've seen my videos, you know, uh, when I see someone coming in with treatment resistance, I'm looking under the hood, we're doing labs, we're trying to figure out what's causing this versus just putting that label on someone. But you'd have to talk to your provider if this is something that they have mentioned to you and make sure that they're teasing it out. When it comes to bipolar, one of the main differentiating factors is the mania. Whether it's hypomania or mania, that is not present in depression. So if you have a hypomanic or manic episode at any point in time of a cycle of depression or coming out of depression, then you get the label of bipolar. And I'm not a fan of the labels anyway, um, because I'm looking at symptoms and treating symptoms and then looking for root causes of those symptoms and helping the patients, you know, to resolve those things versus anything else when it comes to these, these diagnostic terms. But that's the main differentiating factor when it comes to depression, whether it's treatment resistant depression or not in any type of bipolar. Is there a mania present, whether it's mania or hypomania? That's your determining factor. So that's something that you have to discuss. So if there is, if you had a hypomanic episode and, and you've had those, then, then it's treatment resistant bipolar then. Okay. Hello, Michael Tao. Wonderful content as always. Thank you. Um, chronic insomnia for four years, just prescribed three milligrams of doxepin. Any thoughts on the medication at three milligrams safe drug long-term? Thank you. So doxepin is a tricyclic antidepressant. It's an oldie and it's not used much anymore except for sleep. I mean, and in, in, in these cases, like we're talking about this whole treatment resistant label, oftentimes doxepin can be used there. So safe, is it safe long-term? Well, three milligrams is like the lowest dose. And oftentimes it's those lower dosages that are actually more helpful when it comes to the insomnia piece. You're not going to get any antidepressant benefit from three milligrams, but very helpful for insomnia. Now I've seen patients on doxepin very long-term. Now they may have to scale up. They may have to go to six milligrams and then 10 and then 20, right? So why? Because they're developing a tolerance and they're using it every single day. So my advice to you is if it's helping you with your insomnia, it, it, insomnia is one of those problems that affects your entire health. Insomnia, if you're not sleeping properly, you are going to have issues not only with mental health, but with physical health, with chronic inflammation, with 
a lot of metabolic issues and because your your body is just not is not rap, uh, able to detox properly at night because your liver does a lot of its detoxing at night it needs to be in a deep sleep state for that to occur your gut microbiome is going to be dysregulated so there's going to be issues there and then of course the the brain fog the mental health problems the cortisol dysregulation so inflammation etc with chronic issues with sleep so Therapy, CBTI, a cognitive behavior therapy specifically for insomnia, is considered first-line treatment here. However, that takes time for a person to really get to the root cause of, of their insomnia and work on these skills to help to basically reprogram yourself to fall asleep when you go into bed. So yeah, medication like doxepin, I would say is a lot safer than a medication like Ambien or Zolpidem or Lunesta or even the benzos. Definitely wouldn't go there. If doxepin's helping you, definitely a lot safer than those. However, I would look at doing the work with your therapist or maybe a sleep coach to help resolve the insomnia issues and resolve like whatever it is with your sleep hygiene, and those types of things before leaning towards any medication for that matter. So, so that's my thoughts there with doxepin. But I, like I said, I've seen it be very helpful for, for patients and have patients have been on it for many, many years. And like I said, but they just end up having to go up, you know, three, six, 10, 20, like that. Um, and, and the ones that I know that have been on it, um, are at like the 10 and 20 mark for, for many years, like 20 plus years. So can be used long-term, but get to those root causes. My walkies. Hello, my walkies. Can you suggest any other supplements or Ayurvedic herbs for ADHD? Yeah. So, um, ADHD is another one of those that I look for the nutri nutrient deficiencies with the labs that I talk about, basic labs for mental health. And Raul, if you can put that video in the comments as well for people, I think they would benefit from, from at least reviewing that so you can understand what I'm talking about. So when it comes to supplementation, omega-3s, B-complex can be very helpful. Zinc can also be very helpful. And these are things like you know, if I'm looking at deficiencies and, and looking at what those deficiencies are, a lot of times when someone's having lack of focus, lack of concentration, these are the nutrients that are most commonly an issue. Vitamin D can also be a problem there as well. So based off of that, treating whatever those underlying things are, like I said, with, with those nutrients, and then you could also support ADHD with herbs like rhodiola, lots of studies out there, short, short studies, um, or small studies, I should say. So not, uh, but ro where rhodiola has been effective, um, things like matcha, matcha root can be very effective. Um, rubios also very effective. The, uh, lion's mane, um, mushrooms and things of that nature can also help with cognition. ECG, which is found in, in green tea extract, can also be very helpful for focus and attention. Some of these things you can get in combinations um, and even things like polyphenols, which you get from like like um, blueberries, for instance, and that give the, the fruits and the vegetables their bright colors. Uh, rich colors, polyphenols also can be very, very effective for helping with these types of things. And you can get these in, in various supplements. There's also supplements that focus on the dopamine pathway, like a Dopa Plus from Pure Encapsulations, for example, has, you know, the, the, phenylalanine, the tyrosine, like the, the building blocks to help with increasing dopamine, which can be used instead of medication with someone who's completely against medication. You're basically doing a very similar thing with that. And then there's also one from Pure that I like, um, cur Curcuma Sorb Mind, which has the um, OPCs, the polyphenols, and it has... Um, 
curcumin as well, which also has some studies of how it helps with brain health altogether and cognition and brain fog and decreasing brain inflammation. So it has that. And then, like I mentioned, the rhodiola and then, you know, all these other factors, but not that you take them all, but you have to really work with someone who's looking at what will be best for you and what you're based off your nutrient status and all of those things, what would be the best path for you to take? High yield things that can that help most people with ADHD are going to be your omega-3s. And when I say omega-3s, you need to do high potency, high dosing, EPA, DHA, high, so like 3,000, you know, so three grams a day. Um, you know, so that's high potency omega-3s. And then using a, a B-complex, those two together give high yield for a lot of uh, people across the ADHD spectrum, if we're just going to generalize. But I like to look at singularly what's affecting you as a person. What do I see in labs? And where can we leverage these supplements and different nutrients to help support specifically your ADHD symptoms? Okay, next. Ivy. Hello, Ivy. Can low dose antipsychotics help with body focused repetitive behaviors directly or indirectly? Yeah, they can. I, I've seen them be very helpful. Low dose Risperdal, for example, can be very helpful for people with like body picking, even though it's not one of the FDA uses for that. It is something that I've seen in practice where antipsychotics such as that, Abilify low dose, I've seen be very helpful for this as well. And oftentimes in combination with an antidepressant, but I've also seen it singularly be helpful for patients with these types of behaviors. Again, you know, I would always fall back on looking for some root causes of this and what else could be going on looking at those nutrient deficiencies and looking at other factors as well. Trauma can oftentimes be a root cause because it really dysregulates the nervous system. Trauma does. And I, and I think there's not enough talk about the effects of trauma, especially childhood trauma on our bodies in our nervous system. And I believe that that is oftentimes the root cause of a lot of patients problems, especially when it comes to anxiety and these types of body focused, repetitive behaviors. So seeing a therapist who can work with you with that somatic work can be very helpful with these types of things as well. Vagus nerve work to calm the nervous system down. I would be focusing on those things because antipsychotics, even though they're low dose, have their downside and, and have that risk when we're looking at risk benefit ratio, right? Though you may not have those body picking behaviors or body focused repetitive type behaviors, whatever they may be, they, there is a high risk for metabolic syndrome now. Now you're looking at perhaps developing diabetes later on, weight gain, and those types of factors. Though there are others that are less likely to develop those risks, their side effects of those medications as well. And then long-term use, you know, you can go down that whole path with antipsychotics as you do with the other psychotropic medications as well. So just be careful there and, and use it as a way to help reduce the body focus repetitive behaviors while you're doing the work in therapy to get your nervous system regulated again and work with the therapist who can help you with somatic therapies maybe some polyvagal work and things of that nature to really help with your overall, you know, root causes. And, and as well as, like I said, the nutritional factors could, could, could be problematic too much copper and things like that could, could lead to something like this as well. Okay. My walkies, um, can we differentiate symptoms between ADHD and cyclothymia? I guess it's difficult. So, again here so the so the the things if we're looking at ADHD and cyclothymia as a 
like a Venn diagram, there is, there is a lot of overlap of, of these two things. For instance, like the racing thoughts, the lack of focus, perhaps some of that hyperactivity, the restlessness, those types of things. But a differentiating factor for sure between the two is going to be the mania. So is there a manic or hypomanic episode present? Then it's not ADHD. You're going to fall into the cyclothymia. And then also with the mood, as far as depression, that's out of ADHD, that's going to fall under cyclothymia. So those two, if you're meeting the criteria for a major depressive disorder episode or a hypomanic or manic episode, you're going to fall out of ADHD. Can you have both? Yes. So you can have ADHD and you can have depression or ADHD and bipolar. So those are a little more difficult to tease out and will require, you know, an expert to tease out the, the timing of, of your symptoms, any patterns of your symptoms, and be very cautious with treatment. If you have both bipolar and ADHD, you need to get your mood stabilized first before jumping into using stimulants, for instance, for ADHD. Because um, you could throw someone who has both into a manic episode, a pretty significant manic episode using stimulants without a mood stabilizer or antipsychotic present to help to control the bipolar. Um, so, so that's where you, you've got to be very careful. So having both is, is where it becomes difficult, but if you're just doing ADHD versus cyclothymia, the differentiating things are going to be the mood and the manic hypomanic episodes that separate those two. Okay. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys very much. Uh, DJ Rohit, uh, let's see, mobile addict. What should I do? Mobile. So you're on your phone. I've sertraline 50, bortioxetine 10, propanolol 20, tadalafil 10, mirtazapoint. Well, that's a lot. Okay. Um, so you're on a lot of medications. Is this, I'm guessing this is all for this mobile addiction thing. Well, a lot of this has to do with the dopamine that you're getting from the addiction, from being on the phone, all the dopamine hits. And so ultimately best thing is to get away from the phone, like remove the phone and, and whether it's, you know, well, people say, I, you need it for work. I need it to do this. I need it. Well, get yourself in a position where you can take time off work, where you can, where you don't have to be with, maybe it's going into a treatment facility and not having to use the phone and decreasing that, that dopamine tolerance that you've built up from constantly being on your phone. Cause that's probably another reason why with phone addiction or any addictions, because you're hitting your dopamine so much, you can end up becoming, it, it's almost like you need more and more and more just to get that same effect. It's a tolerance. You, you increase dopamine too much that now it's like everyday things that would excite other people and make them happy. Don't excite you. So that can lead to depression, right? Apathy and, and anhedonia, which is not having pleasure in things anymore. And so you're, you're constantly looking for that next high, right? And the high is the dopamine, that reward system. So with any addiction, you have to remove that offending thing, whether it's the phone, whether it's pornography, whether it's drugs, et cetera, you, you've got to remove it. And so Oftentimes for people with addictive behaviors and these types of things, that requires going into a treatment facility and then learning coping skills and learning things that you can do to then when you're reintroduced back into needing to use your phone for work or for, you know, for, you know, to live, because a lot of us have become, let's face it, dependent on electronics and our phones and our devices that you've built these skills that you've learned to put timers on your phone to get rid of apps that ding and do all of those things and just have basic use of the phone. 
and and be more you can become more disciplined in that matter as far as the phone goes and hopefully not even need all of these medications because this whole combination of medications not only puts you at risk for serotonin syndrome but what i'm guessing is you're you're probably because of going through all the dopamine stores you probably hit all your serotonin stores with with this addiction as well that a lot of these things probably aren't doing much for you anyhow but that's one factor i would say is that serotonin syndrome can make you feel edgy and on edge and those types of things so and with all of these medications except for i would say propanolol um and tadalafil is you know you're you're really sertraline vortioxine those two together just not I would never do that combination. Very dangerous. And then mirtazapine, I can understand it's low dose at night, probably because you're not sleeping, but very dangerous combination of medications here. So I don't want to ignore that factor. And I would say that you definitely talk to your provider that you're working with about these other alternative ways. Perhaps it is requiring you to get into treatment because right now that combination of medications is very high risk for side effects and dangerous side effects at that, that you, you need, if you need this many medications to focus on, you know, to help with this addiction, you probably are need inpatient care. And so having a conversation about that versus let's just continue to medicate someone until you're completely numb or in the hospital for serotonin syndrome. I, I don't agree with that at all. So definitely I would work in that area as far as figuring out what we can safely start removing and then working on getting, you know, if it's starting to slowly decrease your use of your phone, giving it to a spouse or a family member at night and stop, stop your use at a certain time or a certain time of day, those types of things to get yourself away from that and then work through whatever those feelings are that come about when you get those urges. It's about sitting through that, figuring out what the urges are and, and why they're perhaps coming is also going to be part of the therapeutic process and something you can learn in a treatment facility or with a therapist who works on addictions. So that's a factor. And then of course, with me and, and, you know, what I like to do is always look at what's going on underneath. What's, what are some of these root causes? What is happening under the hood? What are the nutrient, you know, deficiencies perhaps that could be causing this type of intense addiction behavior? And would you be a candidate for something like lithium orotate, which is nutritional lithium? So looking at those types of things uh, would be something that I would also be looking at. But, but first, lowering your risk of side effects and, and very dangerous side effects with this medication combination would be my first thing and getting rid of the, the, the thing you're addicted to, which would be the phone. All right. Den G. Hello. Um, hi, how long side effects of 20 milligrams of olanzapine and 10 milligrams of paroxetine last? So if you just started this combination, Typically, when we're talking about, that's a high dose to start of olanzapine, by the way. So I'm guessing that, I'm hoping, you started low and got up to 20. If you're still having side effects, then they're, they don't just go away. Um, in the very beginning of starting, whether it's antidepressants or psychotropic medications, there are you know, uh, um, side effects that your body is going to be going through because of the, the adaptation the body has to this now influx of extra serotonin. And, and now with the antipsychotic kind of modulating that and dopamine, uh, it, you know, blocking the, some of the dopamine, et cetera. So if you're, so usually that's about, you know, about a couple of weeks and then they start to if that's the case and they start to improve. And oftentimes when it's that it's issues with gut, because we have a lot of serotonin in our gut as well, that is oftentimes in being increased and the microbiome can become disrupted, which is another factor with medications that we have to be careful with and make sure we have someone looking at these things. But so those things are the things that tend to improve because your body will adapt to that. However, 
if it's beyond that and you're having things like tardive dyskinesia, you know, involuntary uh, body movements, tics, um, restlessness, those, no, they, they, that, that is like more of long-term and, and they tend to progress, especially if you're increasing your dose and you're on 20 now of olanzapine, which like I said, is, is a high dose of olanzapine. Then you have to talk to your provider about this, make sure they're doing an AIMS uh, test on you to, to see if, if you may have some tardive dyskinesia and looking at that and then talking to your provider, whatever, whatever, side effects you believe you're having because perhaps you you need to either come down off the medication or switch to something different um, but again i would uh, you know i've been saying this over and over like a broken record but i i also would want to see what your nutrient levels are what's your vitamin d what is your omega-3 status what is your lipid what are your lipids because that could also be a side effect you don't see right um so liver function. I mean, I can go on and on and on, not just nutrients, but all of those things. So definitely talk to your provider about this would be what I would do. Cause I I'm guessing just based off of that high dose of olanzapine, you didn't just start there and you may be experiencing some long-term side effects. Okay. Lulu. Hello. Um, good morning, Giselle. Um, hope your weekend's good. Can you discuss what is an issue for me? The use of medical marijuana for pain and insomnia when you are on a benzo um, long term. Yeah. Um, so the thing with medical marijuana for pain and insomnia is the same issue with, unfortunately, with medications. What I mean by that is that it can be effective initially. And for the short term, long-term use, however, can lead to neuroadaptation and different things that occur in the body. And with both the cannabinoids and even the THC component, which is the psychoactive component. So it's not just the THC, but it's also the CBD and, and how we have CBD receptors not only in our brain, but in our gut, which is something I learned by an article that uh, was shared by um, by you, actually. Um, and so learning about that was very interesting and in how it can also affect the peristalsis of, of gut, which then affects the issues with the microbiome and overall gut health. So long-term use of the, the medication can lead to problems. But then when you're on benzodiazepines, now you're compounding that. So the long-term use of benzodiazepines, whichever one you, you know, you pick, you know, clonazepam, right? Um, that can also lead to problems with gut health and peristalsis and those types of things. So now you're combining that, which is a huge, huge factor. Then the other issue is that compounds this whole entire picture is now you're not sleeping. You're trying to now increase perhaps the medical marijuana or add other medications to the mix to help because like I was mentioning earlier, sleep is foundational to not only mental health, but overall health because now you're hitting a point of rebound rebound insomnia, rebound anxiety with the benzodiazepine. And then you're trying to cut back on the marijuana because you realize, oh crap, like this is probably why I'm not moving my bowels and I'm not feeling well. And I have all this problem with my microbiome. And guess what? Now you can't sleep. Now you have more anxiety. So it, it's really um, a very difficult problem. And, and it's, it's like a trap. And it's, it's also like this catch 22. What do I do? You know, the most offending agent I would say would be the benzodiazepine, um, to trying to help trying to reduce that. But as you reduce that, you have to now deal with all of the other factors that come into play because now you're reducing your benzodiazepine, which to some degree may be helping to keep an edge off of your anxiety and all these other things in this withdrawal tolerance phase. Um, 
it's very paradoxical as well. So, so there's all of this, this kind of going on and it can get convoluted, but I would say you would get more high yield from removing the benzodiazepine first, definitely doing one thing at a time, not all at once. However, you have to then also be able to deal and handle with those consequences, which is how am I going to deal with my anxiety as I attempt to reduce the benzodiazepine and can I tolerate what that will, what that entails? So that's where support system comes in, nutrition comes in, therapy comes in, learning skills comes in and all these other factors. So overall, yes, you can get into this catch 22, but at some point you have to minimize somewhere. You can try to, you know, if you prefer to do the marijuana first to try to get rid of that and not the benzo, it, it's going to depend on your preference there. But most people high yield will, will do better getting the benzo out of the picture just because of all of the issues with that, especially paradoxical. And then when you're, as you're taking it, a lot of times people end up feeling worse instead of better. So that all has to be weighed in to this whole picture of what's going on. Okay. Gia. Hello, Gia. What is the relationship, if any, between ADD, anxiety, and depression? Okay. I have all three and have started taking meds to address the anxiety and depression, but the meds don't seem to have any effect. So, okay. ADD, anxiety, and depression. So a lot of times these things live together. Um, so, ADD, which is the attention deficit disorder, can lead to problems with anxiety, test anxiety, for instance, that starts in school. And then when you don't do well, you don't perform well, that leads to problems with self-esteem, with overtime leads to problems with mood, and then you start getting depressed, et cetera. So yeah, they, they can definitely all three be connected. And when you're trying to address the anxiety and depression first, depending on where the ADD symptoms are, are coming from, a lot of times they do improve. However, if they're not improving, perhaps it's something else going on. Like I mentioned earlier uh, with nutrients, that could be an issue. So looking at nutrient deficiencies, looking at perhaps there's factors for MTHFR and all of these other things that can really make it difficult for medications to be effective. Maybe it's not the right medication. So there are a lot of factors here when um, they don't seem to be having any effect. And when I hear patients say this, the other thing I want to say is that it's not that it's not having any effect. It may not be having, it may be having some effect, but just not what your primary, like what you're looking for. So you need to tease that out as well. So, so that would be more having to do with dosing and what effect are you trying to gain? Um, because not having any effect, if it's not producing side effects, but you're not having any effect at all, then you either, you know, switch the medication or increase the dose. But for me, I would always look for root causes first and, um, and then also, you know, therapy and things like that and figuring out what exactly are you talking about when you say no effect at all and go from there because that is also part of the mental thing. Because when I say that, I mean the way you're thinking about either how the medication is going to work or have an effect or not having effect can actually be one of the causes of why it's not having any effect. It's how you're perceiving what you're taking and what you're doing and what that effect is. And there's a lot of research out there of the power of the mind and, and how the way we perceive things affects the way how we respond to things. That's There's the, the placebo effect, right? Where people do get better even if they're not taking the actual drug. That's the mind right? So we have to figure that out if, if that's playing a role here, which oftentimes with anxiety, it tends to be a big factor. So how are you perceiving the things that you're taking? Do you believe they're going to help or are you 
may be thinking that you want another medication and you have an idea of what will help you, but your prescriber's not prescribing it. So you're just like, nothing's working. It's not working. What should I do? So sometimes that is what's going on upstairs, right? Um, and and we've got to figure out that that gets a lot of that work gets done in therapy and cognitive behavior therapy and and all of those things to figure out where what it, where is your mind at with all of this because that plays a huge role in how you feel overall. And working on some of these other skills, even for the ADHD with time management, there's lots of tools. There's tools to help keep you focused. There's other things you can do like focus music, lo-fi beats and things like that to help get you in a zone and in a hyper-focused state, which is a superpower that you have if you have ADHD is to get hyper-focused. It's, it's tapping into that superpower um, so that you can start building the confidence and uplifting your mood, et cetera. So, so yeah, there's definitely a link between all three of these. There are lots of things you can do besides medication to really help support this pattern of thinking and, and believing about yourself. And with medications, if they're not having any effect at all, I would question your mindset about everything, question what your beliefs are about the medications themselves, and then you know, looking for those root causes, et cetera, and then going from there, perhaps it's, you know, a completely different treatment for you that, that may require, that may be required to help resolve these uh, symptoms that you're struggling with. Hello, uh, Randir. Um, I have short-term memory problems. I can't recall previous day activity exactly. Please provide some guidance. Short-term memory problems can be I mean, that, that's a very general thing that can be a factor of many <laughs> issues, dramatic brain injury, brain inflammation. It could be part of a depression symptomology. It can be part of an ADHD symptomology. It can be part of Alzheimer's, dementia. So one of the things generally overall, I mean, it's hard to give guidance individual without knowing the entire scope of, of the problem. Uh, which is actually beyond alive, right? I'm not your provider. And, and so I can't really get into the deets. But what I can say in general, when it comes to short-term memory problems, make sure you're looking at, inflammation tends to be a huge, huge factor. So looking at inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, looking at your interleukin, um, which are your cytokine markers, interleukin-6 particularly can be a factor. And omega-3s, looking at your omega-3 index, what is that number? You could be lacking in that. Oftentimes that is the case. So high yield omega-3s, high uh, potency omega-3s, EPA, DHA, um, you know, 3,000 milligrams, so three grams total in a day. You can divide that up if it's too much to take at once and take it with food, that could be overall something you can do. Of course, you know, after running it by your provider, um, cause there are some risks mostly with bleeding, um, that, that can be a factor with high dosing omega threes. So making sure you're reviewing that, but that would be the highest yield. And then, it, and then it's trying to figure out what, what could be the cause. If we're looking at inflammation, brain injury, those kinds of things, and looking at some herbs that can help to, to decrease that. If we're looking at nutrients and we see some B vitamin deficiencies, that can also be high yield. Like I was mentioning with the ADHD question about using supplements and Ayurvedic medicine, the different herbs, oftentimes those can be beneficial like rhodiola, matcha, green tea extract, rubios, um, there's a whole bunch out there that can be very effective for helping um, not only with ADHD, but some of, some of this recall and short-term memory. Um, like I mentioned, zinc as a factor, magnesium. I forgot to even mention that before, but magnesium, oftentimes this can be, be a problem. So it's trying to figure out basically what is going on underneath the hood. What are we missing? What is our body needing? Is, is this short-term recall due to stress? Is it due to anxiety? Is it due to injury? Is it due to age? Um, and then once we figure that out, then it's a little more easier, easier to direct the, the course of treatment for that. So a lot of consideration here, but definitely bottom line is, is get a thorough assessment done 
look at look at your nutrient deficiencies, look at your lifestyle, um, what is going on that could be contributing to the short-term memory problem and, and trying to minimize that as best you can, whether it's with nutrition, exercise, lifestyle habits, perhaps it's time management, seeing a therapist, working on you know, anxiety and stressors of that nature, which can also lead to, to memory issues or loss of concentration because of racing thoughts and, and et cetera. So it's all about finding those things and then, and then resolving it in, in that regards um, first before trying to jump towards medication. That's what I would do. Um, the house of flagrant. Hello. Um, in many cases, patients are frequently being referred out for psychological or neuropsychological testing to confirm the diagnosis of ADHD. What's the standard for diagnosing this disorder? Well, it depends on, um, so, so the reason why this is being done, I'll, I'll go back is because so during COVID and all of that telehealth practices, became the thing. And, and a lot of these, these practices blossomed and it became very easy to connect with, with a, uh, a psychiatrist or a, a nurse practitioner like myself, right. And get prescribed medication, which was good, which helped the overall good of things, right. Cause people needed mental health treatment, especially during that time. But what happened was we found was that it was also something that got taken advantage of where some companies, an initial assessment was only 30 minutes. So someone's just kind of trying to target their symptoms. So if it was maybe anxiety causing your ADHD symptoms, but you were like, oh yeah, I don't have concentration. I can't think this on the other, boom, you got a stimulant. And so stimulants, you know, became the, the prescription of choice. And people were actually coming to these sites and requesting stimulants. Okay. And they were just being given out like pretty much like candy, which is why we ended up with this huge, huge um, issue with shortages, shortages of Adderall was first and then shortages of all this because it was kind of look, looked at as this miracle for your, you know, your, your COVID-19 blues, right? Anyway, so, so that was, that was going on that created this problem. But even before that, there have been psychiatrists and providers, um, you know, that decided that, with, especially with adult ADHD, we need to make sure that this is actually ADHD because a lot of factors can look like ADHD that aren't really ADHD, anxiety, stress predominantly, right? And so the psychological testing that's done really helps to confirm that and really helps the provider themselves to understand that this is something more of an ADHD thing versus something else. And so it helps direct their treatment because stimulants are a controlled substance. They can, they have their own problems. They can lead to abuse potential, high yield for abuse, and they can be hard to get, right? So there's all of that. And then the, the whole issue with the tolerance that develops So taking breaks can be difficult for people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when this whole thing came about, the shortages and all that, and, and everyone just basically wanting to get stimulants for, for whatever their ailment was, providers had to start differentiating and saying, okay, like, let's go back to psychological testing and make sure that this is actually the problem. So though it's not the standard, like when you say the standard, the standard is set by the practice, right? So, so they could do the standard, which is the basic DSM going through a list of symptoms and saying, okay, you meet this criteria. Now that does require some childhood ADHD. So there has to be proof of that. So sometimes providers will say, you know, do you have documentation from school from, you know, when you were a child that you had this diagnosis da, 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 and now it's developed into adult ADHD um, or the psychological testing route. If you don't have that, right, they'll, they'll do that to make sure that there is some kind of form. So that that's the other thing. So they could either do DSM symptom. If they're going to do that, they have to rely on the patient being honest about their symptoms because anyone can go DSM diagnosis of ADHD 
log in telehealth and say to their provider, yeah, you know, I can't really concentrate really well at work. I'm, I'm not really able to prioritize my work. I procrastinate everything. I often lose things and I, and I can't really recall things very well. And, you know, I really think I have ADHD, you know, and, and so if, if that provider's pressed with time, et cetera, um, maybe they'll throw you an assessment and say, take this assessment form and you can just check all the boxes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, which again is depending on you to be honest about your symptoms and then boom, you, you know, you get a stimulant, right? So I think the reason why this standard has been put in place for many practices is because it helps to take away that I'm just going to check a list of symptoms on in a box and meet this criteria so I can get my Adderall or whatever it is. And so it kind of helps to separate or differentiate those two groups of people. And so, yes, that's unfortunate for those who really do struggle with ADHD and do need treatment for ADHD. However, those people who are struggling with ADHD and truly have ADHD will go through the hoops that are required which this hoop may be psychological testing or neuropsychological testing to actually confirm a diagnosis of ADHD, you know, ADHD. If you really are struggling with it and you have it, you're probably going to, you know, end up going through the hoops versus if you're just trying to go through a list of symptoms to get a medication, you're probably not going to go through with it because you're going to, you know, a lot of these tests are very high yield. A lot of them are done in an office setting with a computer, they're tracking a lot of different things. They're tracking your eye movement. They're tracking, you know, all different things, you know, as you're, as you're, you know, doing the testing um, to actually determine whether you have it. And they can actually even determine if you're faking or if, if you're faking in the test or trying to look like you have ADHD, oftentimes it looks more like an intellectual disability in the test versus ADHD. So, so yeah, they're very hard. Those types of computerized tests that are out there um, are very hard to fake. And so that's probably another reason why providers are moving more towards the standard um, versus just a symptom checklist that you can just say yes to every symptom and, and get the diagnosis. Shuban, hello, uh, ma'am, can vortioxetine treat OCD somatization without exacerbating psychosis and schizophrenia or schizophrenia. Try all SSRIs. I'm suffering from dry eyes due to SSRIs. Okay. Okay. So vortioxetine um, is going to have a high um, risk for putting you into psychosis um, and all the SSRIs, especially, um, with, with schizophrenia. Um, I mean, the reason why vortioxetine is a multimodal, um, antidepressant, it works, it works specifically in serotonin as a serotonin modulator, but you're increasing a lot of things, not just serotonin. Um, so other SSRIs would be less of a risk, but can still be problematic. And, um, when it comes to, to treating this with the um, OCD and somatization, you definitely want to do therapy, get into a therapist who specializes in this. You can try some of the tricyclics, um, but those two can, can be problematic. But working with someone who can manage that and work on um, the cognitive side, so working with the therapist, but then also perhaps the antipsychotic can be leveraged because some antipsychotics can actually be used and can be helpful with some OCD symptoms. Some have been shown that it can make them worse, like Abilify and um, its counterpart, Brexpiprazole, um, can also, you know, be um, this risk for the OCD, mostly like the gambling stuff and those kinds of things. But, you know, so maybe it's, you, you know, utilizing another type of antipsychotic and leveraging it to help perhaps with some of your somatization and, and OCD symptoms um, with, without going into the psychosis part. So, so, so that's what I would talk to my provider about, some other ways to leverage it without 
without the risk because vortioxetine can definitely um, increase that risk. And um, so, so definitely taking that with caution, but then um, talking to your provider about some, maybe some other treatment options, and then definitely exploring therapy as a way to work on the cognitive restructuring that needs to occur with OCD. Definitely therapy when someone has OCD is, is required, um, in, in my opinion, and not just medication. You, you have to really work on, on what's going on up here, like I was saying earlier, um, ab about, the, about the whole thing and making sure that, that you're working with a therapist specifically who understands OCD. I think you'll, you'll get high yield from that. I'm going to, ma'am, your video is very helpful and please make a video about meditation, what science and research says about meditation. You know what? I actually was going to do a video about meditation. Was it last year? I, I have a folder and and you know what? I probably will revisit that. The reason why I didn't was because um, a lot of my holistic videos don't get a, don't get a lot of reach. People don't seem to want to watch them. They're the videos, like I did one on stress, um, that has to do a, a lot with, um, you know, how to, how to help modulate your nervous system. I did one on neuroplasticity and all of these different things that can actually help. But, um, as far as, you know, that goes is, is that people tend to want to go towards the pill, <laughs> the, the quick solution, just something I can pop in my mouth versus something I can do. And so when I saw that pattern, um, I actually put a hold on these other videos that I had planned out. And, and the science behind meditation was one of them. Yoga was another one um, that I had planned out. I am doing one on the vagus nerve. I have a few of those because um, I, I actually do vagus nerve work with my patients and finding a lot of, you know, um, improvement. I do also with meditation as well. Um, but, but yeah, that is something I want to revisit. It's a folder that I have that I, that I started the research on and, and kind of started, but I, I abandoned it. So, so yes, I will do a video about meditation coming up. So thank you for, for reigniting that. <laughs> Any thoughts on gabapentin for insomnia? Thank you. Uh, okay. Paco. Hi. Um, I would dissuade gabapentin for insomnia. So the reason why is because it is um, very similar to benzodiazepines and has a very similar issue when it comes to the benzodiazepine receptors and tolerance. And then the caveat with, the, with gabapentin is that it's very difficult to come off and you have to get it formulated um, in a compounding pharmacy, which can be very expensive to come off of it. Um, not everyone, but you know, about 50% of people, you know, so that's a high percentage uh, risk there. And, and it's going to be something like I said before to the person who was talking about doxepin, even though doxepin doesn't have the dependency factors so much as benzos do and gabapentinoids do like gabapentin. Um, but, um, you still have the issue of, are you resolving the underlying cause of your insomnia? So it goes back to what is the underlying cause of your insomnia? Is it sleep habits? Is it the behaviors, you know, fixing that? Is it cortisol? Is it vitamin nutrient deficiencies? Is it magnesium? Is it zinc? Is it vitamin D? Um, my gosh, you can go on and on. Is it gut microbiome? So many things that can affect sleep. And then if you're just putting that bandaid on by taking the gabapentin and it may be effective for you short term, and then you're upping, upping and with gabapentin, my gosh, people can get up into very high dosages with this, but you can get into that whole point where it stops working. Maybe now you start having, um, issues with balance brain fog, very serious memory problems can happen with gabapentin and all of these different issues, your recall, I mean, on and on that I see. And then now you're like, oh no, I don't want this. This is poison now. It's, it's not helping. It's making me worse. You try to come off of it the conventional way and half it and then half it again and then half it, you know, until you're finally off. And then and then your, your nervous system is dysregulated and, and you, you could end up, your 
gabapentinoids could also lead to that bind, like I was talking about earlier with the benzodiazepines, the benzo-induced neurological dysfunction. So look bind up, look benzo-induced neurological dysfunction up and ask yourself, is, is that a risk you're willing to take? That's what I would do before reaching for something like that. Um, and like I mentioned to the other person with doxepin, is that sh very short term, The like I wouldn't even go with gabapentin, but something like that, or even like a mirtazapine, short term, a couple of weeks while you're in therapy, working on setting these routines up, you know, um, and, and getting the, the mind right. So that way you can leverage that and come off these medications safely um, in a short, shorter time because higher yield to be able to do it in a shorter time versus being on them for years and then needing to come off. So, so that's, you know, the things that you have to look at in a scope and looking at risk versus benefit. Benefit is you need sleep. You need to get sleep. So it may be helpful there. Risk is that if you're relying on that long-term, any medication long-term as a solution for your insomnia and not working on the behaviors and underlying nutri nutrients, et cetera, that could be a factor, then eventually that, that solution, the gabapentin, whatever the medication is that you're taking long-term can actually end up leading to dysregul nervous system dysregulation because you develop tolerance, withdrawal, and um, unfortunately can develop that bind um, with, with the gabapentinoids, not with doxepin or the, the non-gaba drugs, but those will have their own problems long-term with dependence and tolerance that, you know, eventually you, you come off of them or you need to come off of them, which can become problematic. So those are the things you have to look into. And I would say leverage nutrition, leverage the therapist first, always first, doing some CBTI, cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, working on your behaviors, working on what could be going on there before jumping to medication, or if you're going to use the medication short term while you work on those things. All right. Stevie B. Hello, Stevie. Um, hi there. I just noticed your channel and I just want to ask a question. How long should anyone take any type of subscription medication? Will there be any long-term impact health issues in the future? Well, I can't really say um, with any type of subscription medication. And you have to be careful here because though my stance is, you know, you're new to the channel, you're new, you know, so, so you probably haven't seen that. Though I teach a lot about medications, my practice is focused on deep prescribing, which is taking patients off of medications, which is something I had switched over to a couple of years ago because I saw the harms of psychotropic medications, particularly benzodiazepines. And then I started seeing the antidepressants and all of those things and, and the need that's out there to help patients come off of these medications. So when I work with you from the, from the beginning, meaning you just started having mental health symptoms. You decided you, you, you know, you might need some help for a prescription. You come to see me. What I do is I work with patients on, let's look at root causes. What can be going on again, working, working up here, looking at labs, leveraging nutrients, right? And then if we need to, to put, to do a SSRI, right? For instance, let's, we're managing anxiety. We do it with the intention of this is going to be short term. Let's do, you know, six months and from then let's titrate off. When I do that, every single patient who has started with me from the beginning where we, where we worked on this, we developed the skills they did. And then we titrate off, titrates off without problems no withdrawal symptoms, no issues. If I shouldn't say no, if they have some, it's very minimal and short lasting. Okay. Versus someone who just comes in traditional provider medication right away, medication heavy. And the other thing I want to mention too, about these patients that I, that work with me from the very beginning is that low dose, we don't go to max doses. We don't end up going to to the max doses of any of these medications, because a lot of the stuff we're doing nutrition wise, lifestyle wise, they getting, I get them into therapy and all of that, right. 
it really is is where the magic really happens, right? The medication is just used as a band-aid. So when we start taking it off, they have been supported with all of these other things. They've been supported with proper nutrients, right? We go back and we retest labs and say, wow, your vitamin D is back to normal normal. Your omegas are great. They're on, they're on track. Your magnesium levels are now optimal. Like the, the person is feeling great. So it's a lot easier. And as you're coming off of the medication, it's easier for the brain to adapt, to readapt because of the neuroplasticity factor. Because once you start doing all of these things that I teach the patients with lifestyle factors and stress reduction and et cetera, finding your purpose, it's, I mean, it goes on and on when you're coming off the medication, your brain is now more able to adapt and would be a neuroplasticity to the, to the problems at hand. And, and you're able to adjust now, and now you have your skills and now you don't need the medication anymore. What tends to be problematic for people when I'm working with them on deprescribing. So now the other scenario is this, they come to me and now they're on medication Oftentimes they're on five or six medications. The most I had someone on is eight medications. Okay. And now they want to come off or they tried already to start coming off and they've got injured. It's, it's very difficult now to go backwards. It, you know, cause now we have to fix all this underlying stuff and, uh, you know, so yeah, the medications have done their damage, so to speak, or, or injury, whatever the term, you know, a lot of the benzo people hate the word damage. You know, they think it's like, Oh, you know, I'm damaged for good, but it's not. Your brain has the ability for neuroplasticity. Watch that video if, if you're stuck on that, but you know, the, the injury or, or whatever you want to call it, that's happened because of the medication that needs to be fixed now before the person can just now taper off the medication. And oftentimes it's very difficult because that medication that was once helping you is no longer helping you. It's actually causing a problem. Now, this is more so the case with psychotropic medications. And when I say psychotropic medications, I'm talking about your antidepressants, your anxiolytics, so your benzodiazepines, your Z drugs for insomnia. Those are the, the worst, you know, culprits, let's say. And then, you know, antipsychotics have their own long-term effects, right? And then when we talk about any medication, because I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner and I'm not in the realm of these other categories of medications, I can't really say that they're going to have the same effect per se, but psychotropic medications aren't the only medications that have a withdrawal effect. Ibuprofen can have a rebound withdrawal effect if you're taking that regularly every single day. And this is an over-the-counter medication. Ibuprofen also has an effect on the gut microbiome that can be very detrimental, an effect on gut health all, overall. This is an over-the-counter over over medication. Blood pressure medications known to have withdrawal and rebound issues with specifically with blood pressure and heart rate, but you know, can have that, right? So we know those things. But we also know, for instance, someone with significant schizophrenia, but you know, issues in that regards, traumatic brain injury with psychosis, that medications like antipsychotics can be very helpful. So can we reduce the burden on these, on these, on the medication need for these people? Yes. Yes. For instance, patient with eight medications is now down to two, right? Significant bipolar one. So, you know, definitely able to be, to be able to do this, but it takes a lot of work on the, the side that patients don't often want to work on. Like I was saying with the, the person who asked me to do a video on meditation. Yes, it's in my queue to do. I would love to do it, but it doesn't 
high people are interested in watching these things when it comes to mental health people are looking for the quick fix so it's up to you guys you know and us as a society to want to do the work to fix and resolve a lot of these underlying issues that can that can be resolved with diet lifestyle um nutrition etc and i'm not talking about supplements either because another thing i want to point out is that the patients that come to me from the very beginning and we find deficiencies i put them on supplements first because we need to correct those deficiencies because they're oftentimes significant we correct them they start feeling better a check in three months if if i'm at a normal level in in any we start tapering those supplements off and start supporting with with the diet and start really you know so while they're on the supplements we're talking about diet and how we can leverage diet get you off the standard american diet start slowly bringing in these things so now a good healthy diet is part of your lifestyle and you know the importance of your diet then we recheck labs again right now we're six months into checking labs and everything's still looking good and your your diet and your lifestyle is now what is the dominating thing supplements are are no longer a thing that you need though there are some that still need maybe the omega-3s and say vitamin d because of uh genetics or um what's another one? Oh, uh, the folate methylfolate because of genetics right so you may need that long term but you may not need the high dosages long term but by and large you can support someone with nutrition exercise meditation and all of these holistic things and get them off of medication and there are on the other side people who come to me you know from the very beginning right and don't need medication. I've had patients that came to me who had a prescription to start a medication from their primary care, but they were hesitant to get it filled or they filled it, but they just didn't start taking it. They were afraid. So they came and saw me first and we worked on the nutrition side. We worked on all this and they started feeling really good and they didn't need to start any antidepressant or any medication. So, so that's the, that is the ideal situation is anyone who's considering medication for something if it's possible because there are some let's face it there are some things like seizure disorder right that that can you know especially if, if, if these seizures are causing injury to the brain and the, you know you you can't just be in seizures all day right you have to have a medication to treat that um but you know there's other examples as well but if we're looking at, for instance, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and looking beyond mental health in that way, there are things you can do now, especially if you've been labeled pre-diabetic, to support your, your metabolism and to start working in, in the, the world of, of nutrition and start creating this lifestyle for yourself that can make you to a point where you don't even need medication. I've had I've seen people do this, friends, family members. Um, you know, patients who have told me like th they were told they were pre-diabetic and now they're not, they're doing great nutritionally speaking um, because of the, what they have adopted as a lifestyle. So that is where we need to move. Um, if, if we're going to adopt a, you know, decrease the burden, let's say on uh, our society with medication use, because there is a long-term impact of using medications long-term, specifically psychotropics, but there can be with others as well. Um, and so we can make an impact in a positive way by as providers looking for root causes first and helping patients from the very beginning when they're coming into the office looking for patterns of dysregulation or dysfunction instead of looking for when it's completely abnormal looking for patterns of suboptimal and i think that's key because these providers are doing this basic cbc cmp which you can find a lot if you're looking into optimal versus suboptimal ranges instead of just saying well you're normal well the norms in labs are based off of sick people so do you want to get to a point where you're now sick 
or do you want to catch it before you get to the point where you're now abnormal in your labs and feeling sick? So that's the other thing. So yes, there's a lot that can be done in primary care if they're looking at your labs with an optimal lens and looking at that, because you can get high yield stuff just from those two labs, which is mostly what providers will do because for some reason they're uncomfortable running vitamin nutrient panels. They're uncomfortable with, with the omega panels. I don't understand it. Um, cause it's, it's very obvious, you know, when, when you have low, you're low in nutrients, what you need, um, you know, but those types of things, like I mentioned in the basic labs for mental health should be part of the basic workup. We should be looking for these things, um, because you can help correct it before it gets into the abnormals. And now you're having all of these issues, not only with mental health, but with physical health. So, when it comes to how long should anyone be on medication, in my opinion, you know, the longest six months, some patients to a year, because we're trying, you know, we're working on still working on some of these other factors and, and then their process of coming off may, may be a little bit longer. It, it depends, but that's what I strive for. I don't want patients to have to be on psychotropic medications lifelong. And the patients that I work with are depression and anxiety, um, so I'm not speaking to those who have schizophrenia or, or significant bipolar, though with those patients, I, I am able to still work with them. And, and I have a couple that I, that I do work with that we can get them to lowest dose possible, right. And minimize the medication burden. So I guess that was a long answer, uh, but it, it required it. Cause there's a lot to, to this question. Right. And, and we don't want to do blanket statements, but definitely there a lot can be done and and a lot can be yielded by going ahead and and working on root causes first besides before just relying on popping pills for the rest of your life ivy hello another question about bfrbs do you view them as impulse control disorder bfrbs i'm not familiar with that term ocd anxiety or in a class of their own um, geez, I'm not familiar with that term. I'm sorry. If you want to elaborate on that, I'm not familiar with BFRBs. It's probably something when, when you tell me what it is, I'll probably will be like, oh yeah, but I'm not really familiar with it. Um, so, so I'm not really sure what, what you're saying there. Oh, body focused, repetitive behaviors. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. When you're looking at DSM, um, they are actually under OCD. Um, th that's how they're categorized. Um, impulse control disorder is also categorized. So, so OCD has its own section now in the DSM, the new DSM. Um, well, it's not five, five anymore. Well, the five, I, I think revise is what they call it. Um, but anyhow is now under, um, so OCD is under its own thing, but it's still considered an anxiety disorder. And, um, OCD in itself is an impulsive, you know, control disorder type of a thing. So, so yeah, the body, um, issues, uh, body picking, trichotillomania, the somatization, all these different things, um, are going to be focused under, the OCD section. Um, so they have categorized it as, as such. Um, you know, I would say not to focus so much on labels, um, focus on the symptoms. Um, we can get caught up with the whole book of labels, but, um, really it's just a group of symptoms that they try to categorize. And I understand why for, for issues with, um, getting FDA recommendations for certain things, et cetera. Um, but when it comes to practice and seeing a patient in front of you, you want to focus on what their primary symptoms are. And then what are some of the things that can be contributing to those primary symptoms, regardless of where you want to label it um, or what you want to label it. That should be the focus. And then again, like I was just saying about the whole spiel of nutrition and, and diet and lifestyle and doing all of those things. And of course, like, like I mentioned, even before that with OCD therapy, first line, go to therapy, make sure you're working on the cognitive distortions, um, especially with the, the body focused, repetitive type behaviors. Um, lots of therapy required there. Um, so, so definitely getting to the root of all of that 
And like I mentioned to you before, Ivy, that trauma is oftentimes the root of these types of disorders. So, so finding out that the childhood trauma, perhaps if you looked at an ACE, um, the advanced childhood experiences questionnaire, if you just type in um, ACE screening, um, if you Google that, um, you will find a bunch of different questionnaires that pop up and just take that for yourself. Because what I find is oftentimes people don't think of some of the adverse childhood events that they've experienced as trauma. And when you say trauma, people say, well, I've never been a victim of war or I've never been raped or assaulted or like physically abused. So I, I didn't experience trauma. But when you look at the ACE, uh, adverse childhood events, some of those things maybe you've witnessed violence in your home as, in, in the way of domestic violence. Maybe you were neglected. There are ways, and, and we may call these little T traumas, but I don't call them little in the fact that they have big impacts on our health and tons of research on, on um, ACE score relation to health factors, not just mental health factors, but cardiovascular factors, metabolic syndrome factors. So having an impact on your, the way that, you know, you, your predisposition for diabetes, predisposition for cardiovascular disease, et cetera, because what these traumas do to our nervous system. So definitely working on that would be top on my list for someone like in, in your position. Absolutely. Psychiatric research. Hello. Hi, I'm a person with MDD. My brain is getting numb and hard. I feel doctors didn't get to figure this out. Why is this happening? What can I do with this? Brain is getting numb. Hard. I feel doctors. Okay. So when you're saying brain is getting numb, that tells me that you're probably experiencing, I'm guessing something like um, apathy, like you're not able to feel emotions, you're, you're feeling like you're numb to things, which can often happen with the SSRIs, the antidepressants, too much serotonin in that region of the brain, like the hypothalamus can lead to turning down emotions, right? Which can be helpful to a certain extent, but turning down too much can lead to this, um, complete like dysphoric state or like this numb state where, um, you're not able to feel. This is one of those risks of long-term use of antidepressants. So when you say doctors didn't get to figure it out, um, why this is happening, just bring up um, emotional blunting and, and perhaps, the, you know, some light bulbs may go off that this could be maybe what you're dealing with instead of adding more and more, because typically what happens when someone presents in conventional psychiatric practice, that's been on an SSRI for a while and they present with this, they'll say, it's your depression getting worse. Let's add something. So they'll usually add bupropion, which can help kind of get you out of the state. But then that stops working and now an antipsychotic or they'll go to, you know, so, so that's, that's where, um, like I was mentioning before, um, in the very beginning when Muhammad was talking about depression, treatment resistant depression and, and the bipolar treatment resistant and all that, the treatment resistant term, I'm not a big fan of because oftentimes it's things like this that lead to the treatment resistance. And it's things like, not looking at the root cause of what's going on and treating that versus just throwing a bunch of pills at someone, which then does create this treatment resistance. And now when you try to take this person off and they have a reaction, they're now told, oh, it's your underlying condition coming back. So let me just go ahead and, and put you back on it, or let's put you on something stronger or Worse yet, let's do ECT or let's do some other kind of crazy treatment on you um, that can have huge impacts on your memory and the way you respond and react and can even lead to more of this numbing effect, right? So so overall, um, when, it, when it comes to this getting numb, it's oftentimes due to the antidepressants themselves and a clue to someone who's an integrative provider 
who works in a functional way, understanding nutrient deficiencies, understanding root causes of mental health, huge clue that serotonin wasn't your underlying root cause, the serotonin deficiency thing, because you have too much serotonin now. So let's figure out what that root cause is as we try to get, you know, taper you off of this medication. That's probably the culprit of now your getting numb feeling and, and probably feeling a lot worse. Um, Shaban, um, Shubha, Shubha, Shubham. Hello, ma'am. Can I take deep TMS for sensory OCD? Oh, TMS for OCD. Yes. Um, has been shown to be effective. There, there is some of that, uh, research out there. Somatoform, somatization, schizotypal personality traits. Will deep TMS be helpful? Are there any side effects of deep TMS? Yeah. So as far as the other, things. I, I know for OCD, there, there is a program you can do for OCD. Not sure about the um, schizotypal personality traits as far as how it would affect that. I, I, I'm really not sure. I don't give TMS. Um, the psychiatrist I work under, though, he does in his practice um, in Jupiter, and, and so I hear some of the stuff with that and, and they're talking about perhaps putting it in our office, um, in Vero, uh, beach, but, but at this point in time, I don't know enough to really say what it's going to, to help you with as far as that personality traits. I mean, it may, depending on what those personality traits you have are, and maybe some of them are anxiety related, um, personality traits. So, um, because, because the TMS can be helpful with um, OCD. There's also um, a treatment thing for anxiety. And then, the, of course, depression, which is, I think, when it first came out was for that. When it comes to side effects, um, I think that, that there are some short-term things that go on during the treatment, but I'm not really versed in it. Like I said, it's not something that I do to really say, like, these are the side effects. It's something I'd have to look up. Um, I, I think it has to do something with maybe, um, vibration or tremor or something like that in the hand, or, you know, there, there, there may be something cause they, they have to look for the movement, you know, to get your threshold. And so some people may um, be uncomfortable with that experience. Um, but yeah, that, that would be something I'd have to look into to figure out other side effects, um, as far as with, with the, the, the TMS or the deep TMS that you're referring to, because I'm really not well versed in that treatment to really speak on it, um, authoritatively. So sorry about that. Denji. Hello. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Five milligrams of olanzapine and 10. Okay. How long side effects last? Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. That makes more sense if you just started this. Um, so like I was saying, to you before, um, if it's something you're just starting, then, then typically they're going to be a week, two weeks max of, of the initial side effects. If you know, so we should be seeing improvement. If, if you're not seeing improvement over that time, then this is going to be, you know, just the side effects of the medication. And then you have to ask yourself versus first is benefit. Is this something I can, I can actually, you know, tolerate, um, so asking yourself those things. And then also, um, again, like I mentioned to you earlier, the root causes, looking at nutrient deficiencies, very high yield, um, looking at medical conditions. I didn't even bring that up, but that's one of the root causes like hyper hypothyroidism, inflammation markers, things of that nature, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, can, can drive a lot of mental health symptoms. So looking at those things. Um, if you're having gut related symptoms, very, very common, like I said, a couple of weeks, take it with food. Um, either of these medications you can take with food to help ease those types of side effects. And oftentimes that, that can help resolve that. Um, but then also work on, um, your gut microbiome, um, meaning like, uh, you know, looking at some good probiotics and, and hopefully your provider can, can help direct you in that way of, um, of, of helping support your gut or look at ways to support your gut health. I do have a video I talk about 
um, like the connection between the gut brain axis and, and how to support the gut, um, that connection for mental health, um, and why it's important as well. So if our will can find that video, I'll have them put it in the, in the chat for you. Um, because that could also be very beneficial for you. Um, not only for the side effects part, but also just because of the long-term effects of these medications have on the microbiome that it's just something to do overall to support your gut, um, health. Um, hello, electrolyte. Hello. I had some questions to ask. Is it safe to combine 1.5 milligrams of Braylor and 15 milligrams of mirtazapine? Does the Braylor cause any mental creativity slowing? Okay. Um, so that combination, um, is safe. The Braylor mirtazapine you're taking, you know, if you're taking them together or separate, um, either way. Now the creativity thing, either of these medications, probably more the mirtazapine, I would say, um, more than the Braylor can, can do the mental creativity slowing and slow thinking. The 1.5 of Braylor, I wouldn't say would do that. Um, but more so the metazapine or even the combination of the two. Like I was mentioning earlier with the other person that was talking about the um, medication um, long-term and the numbing effect, um, antidepressants can have that effect. Like I was saying, because it's too much, you're flooding the brain with too much serotonin now, especially in that, that hypothalamus emotional regulation area of our brain, that it can slow, you know, make you feel numb. And, and for some people lose the creativity. Now, um, when it comes to the, the dopamine piece of this, um, you know, with Raylar, it's a partial agonist of dopamine. So, um, it's going to help to modulate that, not completely turn it off like some other, uh, I mean, antipsychotics do. So that's why I'm not thinking it's that, but maybe has some effect in, in that realm or could, but I would say mostly, um, when I'm looking at, at these two medications and, and thinking about creativity and slowing and slow thinking and, and memory, perhaps it's more the mirtazapine than it is that the Vralar, but certainly something to discuss with your provider. And then, um, like I've been saying, if, if you've missed it throughout, you know, the, like I always say to people, look for your root causes, get those labs done, look for nutrient deficiencies. Cause those could also be, um, causing some of these problems as well. And the medications um, were just a bandaid and now maybe have created so, some of uh, some of these issues with the, the emotional blunting or the creativity blunting and, and um, poor memory. All right. A couple more. We got time for a couple more questions. Um, we got about four more minutes. Uh, Barbara per Barbara P I'm using Alprazolam for a while. 0.25. It helps though, is that safe as a low dose? Okay. So you're using it for a while and you're at the low dose. So the thing I want to mention here is that there is this whole misconception of low dose being safe when there have been people, unfortunately, that even taking the low dose of any benzodiazepine and even the lowest dose have developed problems. If you're taking it long term, um, meaning you know you, you've been on it for more than four weeks, and I'm guessing when you say for a while, it's more than four weeks, maybe it, it's years. Um, you know the the potential of of developing this the long term issues of benzos, the pattern that you would then see if you haven't developed anything yet, is going to be typically that the 0.25 doesn't work anymore. And now you start having some rebound issues or inner dosing withdrawal, like right before, like if you normally take it at a specific time of day, so like right before you, you need to take it, you start getting more, you realize your panic is more, your anxiety is more increased within those couple hours before you usually take it. Your instinct and what conventional psychiatry would, would do is you would say, I feel like I'm getting worse. My anxiety is getting worse. I need more. So that's the clue that now you're leading into this pattern of the benzo tolerance withdrawal. And so you can avoid it by keep going up and going up and going up and going up. 
and then you get to the max and now you have to come down, but that's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous situation to get into. So anyone who's taking a benzodiazepine, no matter at what dose, I make sure that it's important that you understand the risk, even with a small dose. So I'm, I mentioned this in the video that's coming out on uh, the warning to providers, right? And, and in that video, um, I link to a informed consent. So Raul, I'm not sure if, if you're able to tap into that outline that I did there and I have that link to the informed consent. Maybe we can link it here because I think that would be great for people to see that. Um, the people who are channel members already have access to that video, so they, they can already access it if you're a channel member because you get the early access to the videos. But um, but yeah, see if see if we can get that to you know um, to them. And then there's also um, the Benzo Information Co Coalition actually has a page on this danger of low dose benzodiazepines that um, I can't remember. I don't I don't think I have that link in that outline, um, but I, I I do know that they have it that I that I could after the live put it in the description for you. Um, so that you can see what I'm talking about, that there is this whole perception of, but I'm only on the lowest dose, so I guess I'm safe, when in fact that's not necessarily true. So I want you to be aware that that exists um, and that, yes, people can become injured even on a low dose. So when you have someone who's on benzodiazepines for any amount of time, if you're going to see me, I'm going to say we need to work on figuring out ways to with skills to work on treating your anxiety and the person has to take it seriously because i had people come to me yeah i want to work on skills and we're just basically you know going through the same thing because they're not doing the journaling they're not doing the meditation they're not doing you know and it's and it's working on like let's do one thing let's focus on one thing this week and then they come back and they didn't even try it once. Like that's telling me that you're leaning more towards the pill as a solution. So you got to get out of that mindset, you know, and I'm calling you out, <laughs> you know, not, not you specifically, but those people out there that do this, that say like, you know, well, you know, it's easier to take a pill or it's easier to drink a glass of wine or it's easier to do this for a while. But those are, those are all coping skills that are putting band-aids on the problem. So work on figuring out why you're anxious in the first place, why you need the medication in the first place and fix that, whether it's trauma, stressors, issues with your lifestyle, nutrition, uh, maybe it's a medical issue, maybe it's thyroid problems, et cetera. Figure all that out first. And then once you do and you start gaining benefit from that, then start working on seeing if we can taper you off of the alprazolam. That would ultimately be what what I would want to do with, with someone like you, Barbara, is, is work on figuring out what those root causes are, working on those, giving you some high yield things that you can do to manage your anxiety so you don't need that Xanax. And then if you can stop taking it all together, fine, great. If you find that you can't, then we'll work on getting you it formulated into liquid or perhaps transferring over to something like a longer acting like Valium and then just, just taper you off. Um, while we work, continue to work on the skills that's required to help manage your anxiety versus stay, staying on this because there's that risk of staying on even just a small dose long-term. All right, we'll do one more question. All right. Hala Macha. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Please help. My doctor gave me 40 milligrams Lexapro for anxiety. Okay. That's above max dose. And I feel sometimes my brain is inflamed. So I want to know, is there any link between inflammation and depression? Absolutely. And anxiety. Yeah. So inflammation is one of the root causes um, that they have found. There are many root causes of depression. It's multifactorial. It's not just the serotonin theory. Um, the serotonin theory, people overall will say has been debunked. Not necessarily because there are people who do have a deficiency of their serotonin, their neurotransmitters. So, so those things can help in those people, with for those people, but it's not the majority. So that's where the research, when you're looking at making a statistical significance, it needs to have the majority of people 
and not outliers, but there are outliers that where serotonin is a factor, but it's not the majority, this chemical imbalance. Also, serotonin has more role than just mood. It has also, you know, I was mentioning emotional regulation, which is how it helps with anxiety and those types of things, but also with um, neuroplasticity, lot, lots to do uh, help with that, which is where a lot of the work happens when you're in therapy. But because like I said earlier, when you're not invested in doing the work in therapy, which most people are not, then you're not going to get a lot of benefit from no matter what medication you're taking, because there's going to be limit to it. So now you're at your over the max of Lexapro. Um, and so looking at what could be contributing to your anxiety, is it inflammation would require some blood work because that could be a factor. I do talk about this to a point with the exercise um, it's one of the first videos I did, how exercise treats depression and the whole inflammation factors. So if you think inflammation is part of your um, depression, um, part of the, the factors that are causing the depression, look for uh, HSCRP, high sensitivity CRP, a CRP, a SED rate, interleukin-6, um, you can also look at tumor necrosis fa factor alpha or TNA, TNFA, um, to, to look at if these things, if, if inflammation is driving your problem, um, your depression, and if it is, and then, then there are things that you can do to help with decreasing the inflammation and working on vagus nerve again, like I keep going back to that. That's why, you know, I have a video coming out about vagus nerve and the things we can do to really improve our parasympathetic tone, because part of what the vagus nerve can do is guess what? reduce inflammation, gut brain connection, working on the gut, guess what can reduce inflammation. So there are a lot of things to do um, with reducing inflammation that can have high yield, especially if you have the inflammatory component that is a factor of your depression um, versus just keep throwing medication at it. You know, anti-inflammatory diet, exercise can reduce inflammation, um, Start starting with some moderate intensity or low intensity, work your way up those types of things can have high yield for, um, you know, depression, especially when, when we're looking at the inflamed model of depression. So very good questions. I thank you all for submitting your questions. Um, Raul will um, compile the ones I didn't get to answer. And um, if you'd like to go ahead and sign up for my newsletter, uh, levelheadedmind.com, go to the bottom there. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter and um, I'll pick some of these questions out and answer them via the newsletter. So that way, um, you know, some of these questions can still get answered. Um, if I find a, a pattern of questions, then um, perhaps even making a video of, of, of your questions. So I do um, appreciate your time that you've spent here with me today live. And um, you can always catch the replay if um, you missed some of the stuff that I talked about earlier or that I've mentioned that I talked about and you want to catch it, you can always catch it on the replay. So thank you so much again for your time and hope you guys have a wonderful blessed day. Bye-bye.